All right, hey everybody, how you doing? Welcome in. Um, story time again. It's been a while. Uh, this one's gonna be long and uh, possibly a little bit rambly. So, like, you know, get ready. <laughs> um, basically, over the last two weeks, I was in Japan uh, for the Flesh and Blood World Championships. Uh, but I was also there uh, with my significant other. We decided to spend the two weeks. Um, spend the two weeks in Japan, even though the tournament's only like a weekend. Uh, so I started prepping for this format a while ago. The new set came out, Rosetta, uh, and it's a set with wizards and rune blades. And I thought, wow, this is, this is absolutely my set because I'm a wizard player. That's my favorite class. And then my second favorite class is rune blade, but I expected just to play wizard. Uh, Kano's getting a lot of new cards. And then the other two wizards, uh, Vernon's and Asilio are going to be coming out. And I expected to play one of them. The only issue is that when the set came out, the LSS, the Legend Story Studios, who makes Flesh and Blood, decided that they were going to ban some cards, which was honestly a really good idea. Uh, however, what sucks is that some of the cards they hit were cards that you play in Wizard. <laughs> and because of how Rosetta works, if you're going to release a set with a lot of arcane damage, which is what Wizards do, then you need to release things that help prevent arcane damage. So the issue is that <clears throat> Kano lost a lot of his tools. And then they released a lot of tools for combating Kano. So the deck had to become much more all-in because of it. Now, the deck is very strong, <clears throat> but the issue is, is that it lost a lot of its play. While you can do a more powerful thing, whether or not you get to do it is not as much up to you as it is up to your opponent, uh, which felt really bad for me because basically I felt like a lot of my agency was taken away. Uh, and I would still sit about over 50% win rate with Kano, but like I mentioned before, whether or not I won the game didn't feel like it was up to me. It felt like it was more or less whether my opponent messed up, stepped out of line, or just like didn't draw the thing on that turn or didn't bring the sideboard cards or whatever. Uh, it felt really bad. So I ditched Kano pretty early on into testing, uh, and I started playing with the other wizards, Asilio and Verdance. And we realized really quickly uh, that they they fucking sucked. <laughs> they were really bad, basically unplayable. Uh, Asilio is also just a coin flip deck, super feast or famine. Uh, fun fact, I did lose two pro quests to Asilio, though. That was cool. Uh, just basically got high rolled out of my boots. <laughs> Um, the deck does some really cool things. It's just not very good. And then some people are going to say, this is not really a spoiler. Oh, and Asilio did really good at Worlds. Uh, Alex Vore took it and he cashed. He got like top 32 or anything. Um, but the thing is, is that he went four and five in constructed with Asilio and he, uh, just happened to six of his draft. He won all his draft games. <laughs> so it looks like he did really good. But in reality, the Asilio deck did not. Um, the other thing that kind of threw a wrench into all the plans was CYB or count your blessings. It's a new generic card that says gain X life. The red gains three, the yellow gains two, and the blue gains one. Uh, but then for each other count your blessings, it gains one additional. So if you cast the red, which gains three, and you have three other count your blessings in your graveyard, remember there's nine total, you actually gain six life. Uh, so this was basically adopted for a couple of decks, namely Enigma and later new, also Bravo. Um, and it let you play a hyper defensive game and just like really block everybody out. Uh, which kicked Kano in the teeth again. <laughs> Kano is already down. He got stomped. So we're doing a bunch of testing, and I eventually land on Viserai. Uh, he has a very, very strong game plan, and I do a lot of like changing up the deck list, trying a lot of different things, and it feels pretty good, but it's not exactly what I want to be playing. I really kind of want to be playing new. But everyone tells me that the new mirror match and the Enigma match are so difficult to navigate if you don't have a lot of experience on new. I didn't have a lot of experience on new, so I decided I was just going to lock Viserai and go to the event. Um, I couldn't do a lot of testing actually at the event because I was planning on being on vacation, right? So locked Viserai, brought all my cards. Now, I booked my hotel and flights like four months ago, right? We've been on it. Uh, we did some serious searching for like events we wanted to go to, uh, what flights we wanted to get on, hotels, like serious searching. We have a Google Drive 
sheet that's like the most uh, like uh, over ex- over detailed Google Drive sheet I've ever seen in my life. It's like an Excel sheet with so 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 many things on it. Larissa is a very prepared individual. I more fly by the seat of my pants, which is funny because I think of myself as a very prepared individual, but uh, not here. She she kind of <laughs> she kind of outdid me. So we had it all planned out. We were going to fly in. I was flying into Tokyo and then Kyoto, where our first hotel was going to be. Now, Worlds is actually in Osaka, but we're going to spend the first three to four days in Kyoto at a hot springs hotel, uh, which was, it's a natural hot springs on the basement floor of the hotel. You walk down and then it has natural hot springs piped in and you can get in. It's like a community pool. It's gender separated. So you can like get in and relax and everything. And it looked so sick. I was so excited. Um, so we decided we were going to go there and be able to like relax and really like decompress after all the traveling. After a few days, we go to Osaka. We stay there for the week until the end of Worlds. And then on the Monday, we go to Tokyo and we spend the next week there, right? Uh, so she had to fly into Tokyo and take the Shinkansen, the bullet train, to Kyoto. I flew into Tokyo and then flew into Kyoto. Um, again, we have everything planned. We have our tickets. Everything's booked. I pack everything up. I was told to uh, leave some space in my luggage for stuff I buy in Japan. Uh, Spoiler alert, you should do that. But I didn't quite listen to the extent that I should have. I left space, but I didn't leave a lot of space. When people say bring an empty suitcase, they mean it. (laughs) Uh, Just bring an entire empty suitcase, guys. You're going to want to buy a lot of stuff. This sweater, it's new. It's $20. It's my favorite sweater I own now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like Japan's clothes, fantastic. All their other stuff, fantastic. All their food, fantastic. You're going to want to bring a lot of stuff home. So if you go to Japan, just bring an empty suitcase. Just do it. Anyway, I go to the airport. I have my brother drive me. It's a two-hour drive to San Francisco. Get there. Uh, I got like three hours to spare because I do not like to cut it close for flights, especially not when things are riding on it. It's different when it's like, okay, I'm flying to Portland and I can just catch another flight if I miss this one. But like, I am not missing this flight. (laughs) So I show up three hours early. I got a giant ass suitcase. I got like a normal one that's like, you know, like hip height. And then I got like the big one that like goes up to here. It's giant. It's very heavy. Um, And then I got my backpack and then I have a strap bag. I got a lot of things because you got to bring a shitload of fucking cards, right? When you're not sure what you're going to play, all your team switching decks, you got to bring a lot of stuff. There's like, you know, Two separate kinds of formats and everything. Uh, So I get to the airport. I'm lugging in this like giant thing of luggage. And I walk all the way down the San Francisco airport to the international uh, gates. I walk to the Japan Airlines uh, thingy in binders or in boxes. Uh, Literally just like deck boxes. I'm not organized. (laughs) Um, I walk up to the Japan Airlines thingy. And I'm like, hey, I'd really like to check in my bags and go onto this flight, please. And they're like, yep, give us your passport and we'll get your stuff going. So I hand them my passport and they're sitting there and they're clicking away. And I'm just like, do, 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 do. I'm on my phone, whatever. Um, And then they go, "Mm, okay, are you flying with Japan Airlines? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm flying with Japan Airlines. And they go, "Uh, are you sure you're not flying with Japan Airlines through another airline? And I'm like, oh, well, I'm flying with Japan Airlines through American Airlines. Because that's often how it works when you're flying like, uh, internationally, they kind of like team up and they're like, okay, well you have to go to American airlines to check in. <clears throat> and I'm like, so I'm going to cough a lot. I, I did get sick on my trip. I apologize in advance about that. Um, and I'm like, okay, yeah, no big deal. Right. Uh, I'll just, I'll just run on over to American and I'll get checked in and then I'll come back. Uh, the issue is that American airlines is in the domestic terminal, which is like an entire terminal away. So I have to walk with my big ass luggage all the way down across the airport, across the San Francisco airport, with my big old things of luggage. Uh, and I finally get there. <clears throat> it's like a 10 minute walk with my big ass fucking luggage. And I'm like, Hey guys, I'm on this flight, uh, with Japan airlines and you guys. And they told me I have to check in with you and they go, Oh, yep. No problem. Hand them my passport. They click, click, clacky. Not really paying attention. I'm on my phone. And then they kind of give me a look. And I don't like that look. It's the look of, oh, no, we have to give him some news that he might not like. And so I start to get a little worried. And at this point, Larissa is on her flight. She is on the way to Japan. She's up in the air. 
Uh, and so I'm a little bit worried here. And they go, hey, uh, your ticket's pending. I'm like, what do you mean my ticket's pending? And they're like, yeah, it's a, uh, you don't actually have a ticket. I'm like, yeah, I have a ticket. It's right here. Here's my receipt, my itinerary, my confirmation number, my ticket number, and the flight number. I have it all. It's right here. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, so about that. Uh, let me see your credit card that you paid for the ticket with. Do you have it? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's, here's a credit card. And they're like, it ends in 66635. I'm just making up a number. Um, and I'm like, yeah, that's this credit card. But 6635 isn't the last four digits of the thing. It's the second to last four digits of the card. And they're like, well, that's not what we have on file. And I'm like, well, that's not the, that's what I paid with. It's my, it's my card. Like it went through, it said, Hey, you got charged. And they're like, okay. Yeah. Is your last name Mabel? I don't know. I don't remember what the name was, but it clearly was my last name is Van Patten. <laughs> so like clearly was not that. And I'm like, no, it's Van Patten. And they go, yeah, well the card that ends in 6635, we have registered under Maple as the last name. So the charge was just pending. It didn't go through because it didn't match the name. And I'm like, how did you, how did this happen? Like I put my card in online, Google auto filled it and then bought it. And it says, congratulations, Caleb Van Patten, <laughs> your card has been charged or whatever. I got a notification from my bank. And they're like, I don't know, but basically what's been happening is your card has, your ticket has been pending this whole time. And I'm like, it never told me that. Like I, <clears throat> it said I had a ticket. I am on this flight. And they're like, yeah, well, you're actually not. <laughs> you never actually bought the ticket. We just told you you bought the ticket. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And I would like to point out that I'm going to sound frustrated and we're telling the story. And I was very frustrated at the moment, but like, I'm not aggressive in person, right? So, so I sound very like snarky, but that's just what's going on in my head. I'm actually very polite anytime I have any issues with this because it's like not their fault, right? It's like American Airlines fault. Um, so yeah, basically I'm like, okay, what do I do now? And they go, well, you're fucked. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, um, all right, uh, can I, can I get on this flight? Like, okay, so I don't have a ticket. Whatever. Can I get on this flight, though? Can I get a ticket? And they're like, yeah, okay, hold on. Let's try. Yeah, okay, so that flight's full now. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, you're kidding me. You're fucking kidding me. Like, I got to get to Japan today. Today. You know? And so I'm like, all right, so what do I do? And they're like, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm like, do you have any other flights to go to Osaka? Like, or like, yeah, to go to Kyoto or Osaka. And they're like, well, no, not for the rest of the day. We can get you there in two days. And I'm like, well, that's not going to cut it. What do I do? And they go, well, you got to try to find another airline. <laughs> and I'm like, I got to try to find another airline today <laughs> to get me to Japan. And they're like, yeah, basically. Okay. So I have to like, I'm like, can you recommend me one? And they're like, yeah, you can go to Japan Airlines again and you can try to book a flight with them. They have a flight that goes to Osaka in like, I don't know, like two hours. Uh, oh, sorry. It was less than that. It was like an hour. The flight leaves in like an hour. And I'm like, Okay, so I sprint back through the San Francisco airport through terminals with my big ass luggage again. Just it's like a half a mile, guys. I'm just like as fast as I possibly can sprint back to the Japan Airlines booth. And I say, hey, I hear you have a flight to Japan. They fucked me. Can you get me on this plane? And they're like, oh, yeah, no, we totally can. Also, they don't speak English. So, like, this is a really difficult process. They speak, like, very little English. So, at some point, I have to sit there with the Google Translate thing and be like, hey, can you unfuck this situation? And then they go, uh, not really. And then we just keep doing that back and forth. Oh, my God. It was so stressful. And so, I'm like, okay, can I get on this plane? And they're like, yeah, there's one seat left. <laughs> 
And I'm like, oh, sick. Like, uh, give it to me. How, how, much, how much is this? How much is this? And they like tap it on their thing. And they like whisper to each other. They call over their manager. They point at the screen. And I'm like, I don't like, I don't like how this is going. And they go, okay. And so their manager like spoke English. And he's like, all right, we have bad news. <laughs> like, what? Do you not have the seat? And he's like, no, no, we have the seat. Uh, it's a one-way flight to Osaka. It leaves in now 40 minutes. So I have to go through, I have to get my bags checked, go through security, and get on this fucking plane that boards in 20 minutes and leaves in 40. And I'm like, and then it doesn't even get me to the city I want to go into. And I'm like, okay, well, how, how much is it? How much is it? And they just, they don't, <laughs> you know it's bad because they didn't tell me. They wrote it down on a piece of paper and then slid it to me. And I look at the piece of paper. And to get on this one-way plane. Reminder, I don't have a flight back anymore because I booked round trip. So they slide me the piece of paper. I look at it. $1,400? Decent guess. It was $4,500 for a one-way flight to Osaka. The wrong city. So, uh, no. <laughs> So I'm not doing that. So I say, do you have anything else? And they're like, no, we can get you to Tokyo in two days. And I'm like, oh my God. Like, I'm actually just not going to get to Japan. My girlfriend is stuck in Japan for multiple days without me, which to be fair, if you're going to be stuck in a place, it's a pretty good place to be stuck in. But like, this is not good. So I'm like, is there any other options available to me? And they go, yeah. Actually, there's a budget airline. They were very helpful. They're like, there's a budget airline. It's over there. It's six rows down in this, like, basically other fucking terminal. It opens in five minutes. They're not open yet. They still have two seats left. But people are going to be there when it opens. And they're going to try to get on the planes because that's how the budget airline works. So you need to run there. <laughs> And you got to be the first one in line when it opens. And then you can probably get to Japan. That's it. That's all they said. Probably get to Japan. Not even like get go where I needed to go. They said you could probably get to Japan today. And I'm like, okay. So I grab my big ass luggage and I start sprinting through the airport again. Just, just running with like 100 pounds worth of luggage almost. And the, I see it in the distance, and there's people milling around waiting for them to open. They're having, like, a group huddle before they, like, open the thing. And there's people milling around, but they're not, like, lined up. They're just milling around. So I run. Run with my luggage, and I run straight to the – I'm, like, moving in front of people, and I just, like, stand there where the line would start. Because, like, they were kind of ready for it to open, but no one had gotten in line yet. So – I was going to make sure I was the first person actually in line. So I get there and they open the line and I walk up and I say, Hey, I hear you can get me to Japan today. And they say, let me check. They call someone over. They whisper a little bit. They're pointing at the screen and they say, yep, we have one seat left for you. It goes to Tokyo. I'm like, oh, can you get me to Kyoto? And they're like, no. <laughs> and Tokyo and Kyoto are very far apart. And they're like, okay, can you get me to Osaka? And they're like, <laughs> and they go, no, but we can get you to Tokyo. <laughs> So I'm like, all right, fuck it, man. How much is this flight? I'll I'll take it. And they're like, you actually can't, you actually can't buy the ticket at this booth. <laughs> you have to do it online. <laughs> and there's one ticket left. <laughs> so I say, thank you. I get out of that line. I pull my phone up and I'm Googling as fast as I can. As fast as I can. And I get on the website, it won't fucking load because I'm on airport Wi-Fi. I'm just refreshing like a madman. But I get the goddamn ticket. 
it cost me like $800 for a one way on a budget airline before I have any bags checked, but I get the ticket. I'm going to Tokyo. Here's the issue. <laughs> I don't have any way to get home. So I'm going to spend the next hour searching because the plane's not leaving just yet. It leaves later. I just had to get the ticket immediately. But I'm like breathing better because I got, I got my flight. <laughs> and then right about then, Larissa lands and she calls me and she's like, what the fuck happened? <laughs> and I'm like, hey, listen, bad news. Can't get on my plane. Good news. Still going to Japan. I'll let you know when I know more. So I'm like searching. I find another one of their flights that comes back back from Tokyo on the day I need to leave, but it's super late. It's at like 10 PM, whatever. Don't care. Book it. Uh, there was two tickets left. I just bought it. I'm like, I'll figure it out later. Um, now I have to figure out how I'm going to get from Tokyo to Kyoto. And I went deep. I read every Reddit thread. I read every article. I went through all the sites that were in Japanese and then like Google translated them, read them to try to figure out how I could get from Tokyo to Kyoto. And anyone who's been to Japan is like, oh, just take the Shinkansen. It's not that bad. That's super easy. However, my plane landed at 8.30, and the last Shinkansen leaves at 9.30 p.m. So the issue, how much was the budget ticket? $1,600 round trip before I checked bags, which was expensive. But I got to fucking Japan. <laughs> Spoiler. Uh, so I can't take the Shinkansen until the morning. So I start looking at all these other options. Okay, what if I just fucking Uber? How much is that? Oh, it's $600. All right, well, let's not do that. Uh, okay, how about how about the night bus? Uh, nope, can't do that. It leaves too early, funny enough. Um, how about subways? No, I can't get all the way there in time. All right, fine. So I spend like two to three hours just stressing and trying to figure out if I can get to Osaka. I mean, uh, Kyoto. I can't. Long story short, I can't do that. Um, so before I get on the plane, I have to book a hotel in Tokyo and then book my Shinkansen ticket uh, for the morning up. But I've never been to Japan. The public, the public transit is currently a mystery to me. It's not anymore now that I've been there. But like at that point in time, I'm like, I have to get all this shit scheduled. How do I, how do I get to the Shinkansen? Like, where is that? How, how does one get on board? Can I bring my luggage? So I'm just stressing the whole time. But I get it figured out. Kind of. I'm, I'm, Beat, dude. I'm mentally boomed. I get on this fucking plane. Budget airline plane. They don't give you food. If you want a water, you have to buy it. If you want a cup for your water, you have to buy that too. Like you have to buy the separate plastic cup. It's ridiculous. But they had this really good like shin spicy ramen that I ended up buying. So that was sick. Um, get on the plane. It's like 14 hours to Tokyo. So I finally get there. It's miserable. For an international flight, dude, this is a budget airline. This is the Spirit Airlines that flies to Japan. Like that, think of that in your head. That's what you should think of. I'm I'm on a Spirit Airline flight to Tokyo. <laughs> um, it sucked. <laughs> it was like okay, as far as like budget airlines went, it's like it was really good, <laughs> but it was a, still a budget airline flight. Uh, but yeah, I had Shin Ramen. That was great. I did buy water and a Coke. And a highball, which was terrible. I was like, oh, I hear people in Japan drink highballs. They do. Uh, but it's still whiskey. I don't like whiskey. Do they have TVs? No. They didn't have TVs in first class, bro. Spirit Airlines to Japan <laughs> is what you need to picture in your head to accurately feel what the situation I was in. 14 hours. I land in Tokyo. Get off the plane. I can't sleep on planes, so I'm just mentally not there. <laughs> Right, I've been up and traveling for like 30 hours because I was stuck at the airport for so long. Uh, 30 hours might be an exaggeration, but not by much. Maybe by like six hours. Uh, you have to go through immigration. So I go. I have to stand in this long-ass line. Uh, and then this elderly Japanese man, I walk up to him. He's, you know, in uniform or whatever. And he basically needs me to f get fingerprinted. Because you have to do your fingerprints and present your passport when you go to Japan. Uh, and so he says, uh, hello in Japanese. Right? Uh, and my brain just was not ready for the language switch. Because I was stressed about everything else. It just didn't occur to me that I would get off this plane and they wouldn't speak English to me. I just like didn't think about it. 
right? I, I just had so many other things in my mind. So he like looks at me and he says hello in Japanese. And I just stare at him. I'm just like, and in my brain, I'm just like, Caleb, you don't have to say hello back in Japanese. Just, you can, just, you could just repeat what he said, but it's like not coming out. So I'm like, just say, just say it in English. Just say it. It's fine. You can just say hello. What if you didn't know what Konnichiwa meant? I, I, I didn't. I did. I did. Uh, but I was like, you can just, you can just say hello in English. It's fine. He's, he can tell you're white. Like just say, just say hello. Right. And I sit there and I stare at him and my brain just, my brain just breaks. And I, I say, I say hello back in fucking Korean. Which is so racist. <laughs> and he just stares at me. So I'm panicking. And I'm like, oh, and then he just looks at me like. And then he just kind of slowly like. Just gestures for me to keep moving on. <laughs> and I like give him a little bow and then walk away. And I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> I do my fingerprints. I turn in my passport. I get the fuck out of that room. Oh, and then I get in a taxi to get to my hotel. I don't want to try to figure out the public transit system right now. I'm so beat and I have big luggage. So I just like get a taxi. It's 20 minutes to my hotel. I booked one really close to the, to the hotel. Um, I get in there and I'm just so excited to sleep. I'm so bent out of shape. Again, 14 hours, Spirit Airlines. Uh, and I'm, I'm stressed. Everything's tense. I go to lay on the bed. And if you're not aware, if you haven't been to Japan, or even if you have, but you only stayed at places that are like more for foreigners, if you go to a, a hotel that's made for Japanese people to stay, um, the bed is going to be very hard. <laughs> the, the bed and the pillow are hard and small. They like they like everything to be very like their mattresses are like small and the pillows are small and hard. That's just like what they do. Um, are you tall to pick with a tall card game players? Not giving I'm five ten, which means that I'm tall in Japan, <laughs> which is really funny. Uh, but we will get to that. Don't worry. So I lay down on this brick of a bed, try to sleep. I am exhausted. So I do fall asleep and I wake up just all bent out of shape. It's so bad. Um, but I get up, I take my big ass luggage over to the train station. I hop on the subway with it. It was a bitch to figure out because I was again, just not familiar with it. Uh, and sometimes I'm not very smart. I'm still tired. Still don't feel good. Get on the train, get to the Shinkansen, which is a bullet train, which by the way is amazing. Uh, I once read a tweet, which is like when I'm in Japan and I get on the bullet train, I see the enraged that we don't have this in America. And that's exactly how I felt. I got on the bullet train. I did the whole process. I got on the bullet train. I bought a ticket for a non-reserved seat. Um, and if you're not aware of what that means, uh, basically it means you can sit anywhere, but only in the non-reserved sections and you can't put your bags somewhere. You have to like hang on to them. Um, I did ship my big bag to the hotel, which is a fantastic service. And if you go to Japan, you should do it. Just ship your bags everywhere. Uh, the airports do it. The hotels do it. It's phenomenal. Take like a smaller bag, put your clothes in there for a change for a day and then ship your bigger bags. But anyway, I'm on the Shinkansen. Non-reserve tickets. I don't know which train cart to get on. I don't know the difference, but I'm looking at it and I know that I'm not supposed to get on the reserve section. So I look on this train cart all the way down and I don't see anything. And I walk through and I'm like, you know what? Maybe there is something that says that it's reserved. So I walk back out and I look again, does not say reserved. Get on the train, sit down. About 30 minutes in, this guy walks up, the train guard man, I don't know. And he says, hello, can I see your ticket? But he says it in Japanese, uh, but he knows the word ticket. So that helped. And I was like, oh yeah, for sure. And so I handed my ticket and he says, hey, you're in the wrong spot. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I can move. And he's like, nope, you can't. You actually have to pay for it. So I bought my reserved seat. <laughs> Apparently, I was in the reserve section. Oops. Oh, well, whatever. Nothing's been going right yet. So why not this, right? Uh, but I take the bullet train down and I meet up with Larissa. And I'm just I'm just so happy to be done with all the beginning part of the traveling. It was just it was just so miserable. <laughs> I get there. The hotel's great. It's very like traditional Japanese. You're not allowed to bring your shoes into the hotel at all. You have to like check your shoes in uh, lockers when you walk into the hotel because the entire floor of the hotel is tatami mats. 
um, which was really cool, actually. Oh, so we spend the next couple days in Kyoto. It's really nice. That's where the kimono picture comes from. Yeah. Um, not in the hotel. We went to a shrine. We went and rented kimonos. She looked way better in one than I did. That's for sure. Uh, and then we went to um, a shrine. We walked around and <laughs> we're taking pictures and stuff. And then she's like, hey, go walk ahead of me and I'll take some pictures. And <laughs> I'm like, okay. But every time I start walking ahead of her, she just starts giggling. <laughs> And I'm like, what is so funny? And she's like, no, 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 just keep walking. Just keep walking. And I'm like, okay. And so I start walking and she just starts cracking up again. You know, we're walking in like a crowd of people. And I'm like, what? What is so funny? And she goes, I'm trying to take this picture, but <laughs> your ass looks so fucking big. <laughs> she's like, you know the meme where it's like, I'm trying to hide, but the clap of my ass cheeks is like alerting everyone. She's like, that's what you look like right now. <laughs> because of how the kimonos work you tuck them in but on most people they look normal it gives them a little bit of a bump but it looks normal the issue is i am i am a larger than the average japanese person and so i have a little bit more junk in the trunk and so it's it's funny the pictures are very funny because it's like my back and then it goes like boom <laughs> because you have to tuck them in so it like billows out and it, it does look very funny uh, we had a really good time. We took some really good pictures. Um, and we just kind of hung out for like a couple days in Kyoto. Very nice place. Um, again, anytime you see anything that like the the locals are like getting, just go get it. Uh, anytime there was a stall that was filled with locals, we'd just go buy whatever they had. And it was like always the correct decision. But uh, after that, it's time to go to Osaka. Start testing for worlds with the team and everything. Uh, I tested with a lot of people. A lot of people. I'm not going to name them all in this, uh, this story time, but, um, yeah, a lot of people, uh, Yuki, Nia, Casanova, Peter, bunch, like literally a bunch of people. Sorry if you didn't get named, but there's a lot. <laughs> and I'm really worried that I'll accidentally leave someone out. So I'm not going to name them all. Um, we get into Osaka. Our new hotel is much more like catered towards foreigners. So they have like bigger, comfier beds. Do y'all have a rented house? Uh, Larissa and I did not. We just are staying at hotels. We decided to go bougie on this trip. So we're staying at like really nice hotels and stuff. Uh, but some people had a rented Airbnb and we went and tested there. Um, again, pretty locked on Viscerai. We're just like getting some last minute reps, did some last minute drafts. I focused a lot on drafting for this pro tour. Uh, and so I was really looking forward to the draft section of worlds. And, um, I was doing really well in practice drafts. I often got forced onto Asilio because everyone's like, oh, he's the wizard player. I'm not going to play wizard. And they just give me wizard stuff. And then I'd end up playing wizard. So I played Asilio a lot in practice drafts. Um, everyone's kind of flip-flopping between decks. But everyone kind of lands on their stuff. We have a really good Aurora list that we're very proud of. That like half the team landed on. I say we. I did nothing. I was like just... Sometimes I just tested against it. That was my job. <laughs> I was like, hey, we need someone to play Viscerai into it. And I'd be like, I can do that. Um, but the team, mostly uh, Ellie Bird, built a very, very good aurora list um we had a lot of people at the airbnb testing not just people that were in our immediate group uh brian and mercy came you'll hear that name later for reasons um came and tested into us um and their lists were kind of similar to ours but not not quite probably still like 10 12 cards off um and from what i heard and what i saw uh they kind of got dumpstered a lot uh, all our lists were outperforming their list very, very hard. Um, and so last minute, like the night before worlds, um, Brian and mercy talked to Ellie and Nia and everyone else and said, Hey, can we play your list? Can you teach us how to play them? Uh, and so Ellie woke up like super early and stayed up super late to teach mercy this Aurora list. Um, tell her how to sideboard, how to play the lines, that kind of stuff. Uh, and world starts. Again, I landed on Viscerai. Uh, the list was fine. I think my Viscerai list was better than the average person's Viscerai list in Worlds, but it wasn't quite like where it needed to be. I knew it could have been better, but the issue is I didn't know how to make it better. And because I was the only person on the team playing Viscerai, it was going slow. The improvements were coming slowly because it was just me, right? Uh, other, I could... Uh, like ask other people their opinions. Other people would give me their, like, you know, I could use them as sounding board and stuff and testing, but because they weren't playing Viscerai, it just slows the process down. It, you know, cause it's only me 
doing the like, okay, well, I think I should try this. So I switch it out, ask someone to play some games, ask what they think, blah, 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 then make another iteration. If we had three or four people playing this right, we get to the final iteration much faster. So I was about a week away from like the final iteration where I would have been really, really happy with it. Um, and I'm not, I'm honestly not stoked to play it, but I find uh, a picture. Well, I didn't find it. Someone else found it and showed me a picture of Michael Hamilton's ProQuest winning list of the weekend before. And it's uh, Count Your Blessings New. And I'm like, holy shit, this is the sauce, <laughs> right? Like, I think this is tight, but I have no reps. I need, like, if I decided to just full send testing, I think I could have switched to it. And I think I should have switched to it. Uh, but I just, I was going to spend most of the time in vacation mode with my, you know, girlfriend that I don't get to see super often because she lives on the East coast. Um, so I didn't, I stayed with Viserai, but I really wanted to switch. We start worlds. I'm probably forgetting a bunch of stuff. This is a very long story time. We're not, we're not, we're only like halfway through. Um, I start worlds and, um, I'm sitting down, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The night before we have the, the big, uh, banquet with like the keynote speech. Uh, and I go up and I talk to Brian who uh, makes flesh and blood, right? And I'm talking to him and we're talking about decks we think are good in the meta and you know, that kind of stuff. And he's talking, I'm like, what do you think is good right now? Blah, blah, blah. And he's like, yeah, I think there's like four decks that are really, really good. And then like everything else is not good enough. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, what are you playing? And I'm like, I'm playing one of the decks that's not good enough, I think. And he goes, oh, what is it? And I'm like, it's Viserai. And he's like, yeah, I think your deck is, I think Viserai is like in between the tiers of the four best decks and the decks you shouldn't be playing. He's like, I think it's like the fifth best deck. And I'm like, yeah, I totally agree with you, which was a totally reasonable thing to say. And I 100% agreed, but because I like to give him a hard time and everything, uh, basically anytime anyone else walked up, uh, they'd be like, hey, Majin, how's it going? And I'm like, oh, it was going really good. But then Brian told me that my deck sucked. <laughs> <laughs> so every time somebody would come up, I would work into the conversation that Brian told me, right? He's, he makes the game, right? So it's like, he, I would work into the conversation that he told me that my deck was bad, but every single time I would do it, I would make it worse and worse and worse, right? Like first it was like, oh, Brian told me my deck wasn't very good, which was still a lie. And then I'd be like, oh, Brian told me my deck sucked. And then the next time was like, oh, Brian told me my deck is literally unplayable. And then the next time was like, Brian told me my deck is unbelievably bad and that I'm not a good enough player to redeem it. <laughs> and then, oh, Brian told me my deck sucked, but I suck even more. <laughs> Just worse and worse. And every time he's standing next to me, he's like, I did not say that. <laughs> so, you know, we had a good time. Um, and then the next day we start. Uh, I sit down across from my opponent, and they're playing Enigma, and it's a it's either like the CYB matchup, which is difficult, or the not CYB matchup, which is good. It's the not CYB matchup, so I'm very stoked. I'm really happy. Um, we're playing it out, and there's an interesting spot where like I'm playing one copy of Rattlebones, and Rattlebones is really really good. But the reason I'm playing only one copy of Rattlebones is because if you're playing against a Mystic deck and they have Passover. If you cast Rattlebones and they pass over your target, the Rattlebones fizzles. And a lot of times, you have to start your turn by casting Rattlebones. And so you're not casting an instant speed. So if they pass over your target, your turn ends. You don't have an act, you don't have go again. Um, and it can be backbreaking. So I'm like playing out the game, things are going really well. And then my opponent like uh, blocks with helmet and plays Mirror Guy and attacks me with it with Tunic. No arsenal. No nothing. All their equipment's gone, basically. And I'm like, okay, I just need to have a hand that does anything, and then it'll be fine. And I look at my hand, and it does fucking nothing. So I, like, block six, and then, like, grasp and send my sword. Like, it's so bad. It's so bad. Uh, my opponent's like, okay. And they just, like, block a little bit, and then they send their mirror guy at me and play something else, right? Uh, and now it's the game's really close. So I drop my four, and the issue is, is that my hand can either send six damage, which is easily blockable, or I have a blue card and rattle bones and I can cast rattle bones, get swarming gloom veil, attack with swarming gloom veil, attack with something else and then attack with sword, which is good. But my opponent hasn't played Passover yet and they haven't pitched it. I've been watching. 
and they only have about 20 cards left before they hit their pitch deck. So if this Rattlebones gets pass over, I probably lose the game where I was in like an unlosable spot two turns earlier. And I'm literally sitting there and I'm like, should I just block with this Rattlebones? Should I block with this Rattlebones, send like not the best turn, block with one card and then come at him again with like a real hand? And I'm like, I don't think I can do that. I think that's just signing up to lose. If my opponent draws like two good hands in a row, I just lose the game. So I, I don't think I can do that. I'm just going to keep the Rattlebones and the Rune Rager and we're just going to go for it. Block with the card and I just go, okay. And I pitch my blue and I cast Rattlebones and I say target swarming Gloomvale. My opponent looks at me and I, I look at him, right? I'm just waiting for him to say like yes or to pass over. And he looks at me and he goes, yeah. Like He's just like waiting for me to do it. And so I, I'm like, oh, thank fucking God. I banish my Swarming Gloomvale. I have a couple rune chants already. I attack with my Swarming Gloomvale. And my opponent pitches to block the rune chants. They pitch a blue to block two rune chants. They pitch Passover <laughs> to block the rune chants. <laughs> they just didn't know. They just, I'm like, you're kidding me. Oh, I just dodged the biggest bullet on the planet. They didn't know that you could pass over the Rattlebones target and end the turn. I'm like, I can't believe it. I cannot believe it. And I end up winning the game because of it. Absolutely insane. Uh, so that's really fortunate for me. Start 1-0. <clears throat> and I'm like, Whew. but that was my good matchup. So it doesn't feel great that I had to like rely on that. Um, <clears throat> it was just an awkward game. Like I was winning because it's a really good matchup, but we went through like 40 cards and I didn't see a single Mordred or Rebel. So if I got stuffed, I was just going to lose. Like I had, I had to have this Rattlebones do go. Um, round two, I play against Noah Bagelman who top eight worlds. Um, really nice guy. Really, really strong player. And he was on Viscera, and I'm like, God damn it. Cause I knew he put in the time and, uh, he starts and what you want to do is go first and you want to set up. So he wins the die roll, uh, and he looks at his hands for a second and then he becomes the Ark Knight, discards some shitty attack, grabs red Malefic, casts it, casts red, read the runes and then arsenals, the literal, literal best start you can have, uh, like ac actually literal best start you can have. And I'm like, okay, that sucks. I look at my hand. It's four reds. I can't cast a single one of them. So I have to go pitch two reds to grasp of the arc knight, pitch a red to attack with my fucking sword. So he gets the best turn one setup play you can possibly have. And I send back four damage. I do not win that game. <laughs> He's playing like a very defensive version with six D reacts uh, and some other stuff. I actually tested a version like that and I was really happy with it, but it didn't quite come together. Um, he went a little bit deeper and ended up locking it and it was really good. Uh, I think if I'd have had the other week, that is actually the list I would have ended up on is something very, very similar. So it was cool to see the list and I was like, mm, that's what I was trying to get to. You know, it's nice to actually see it work. I did not win that game, by the way. Uh, so that sucks. One and one. Uh, you have to go um, five and three in order to make day two, right? So I'm one and one. Uh, round three, playing against the Zen. And the big thing against the Zen matchup is that they can block with their helmet, get a chi, and activate Zen State. Zen State is a token that basically for two turns is going to block one point of all damage sources coming at them. That's pretty good, but it's really good against Viscerai because Viscerai stacks rune chance. He stacks a lot of chance, and they each individually come in for one, so they don't do anything. Um, and then a lot of Viscerai's attacks are wide turns, so you attack with like a three power, three power, three power, sword degree, uh, which is bad if they have Zen State because it blocks one of those two, right? One of each. So it's about playing around Zen State, which is difficult. Now, I put a card in my deck called Condemn to Slaughter, <clears throat> which is a one-cost non-attack. Give the next Runeblade attack uh, plus three, and you can blow up one of your auras and force your opponent to blow up one of theirs. Uh, the only aura they play is Zen State, right? And so we're getting to a point in the game where I have all these attacks, uh, and I can set up all these rune chants, but I know my opponent can Zen State. So what I do is I cast Mordred Tide, which basically doubles the amount of rune chance I get, and I attack with a small attack. Because I know my opponent's going to block with their equipment and then blow up the Zen State. Or at least that's what I want. Uh, and that's what they do. They block with their equipment and they activate their Zen State. And I full pivot. I stop attacking, I close the combat chain, and I cast, like, become the Arknight, discard an attack, read, like, Malefic, read the runes, go. I have 12 rune chance or whatever. 
Now you have to kill me. Uh, he's not able to kill me. I take another turn off, build up a little bit more rune chance. And then once the Zen state token dies, I send it all in and we win the game. Uh, I felt really proud of that moment because I had set up the turn specifically to beat. Um, sorry, I I don't become the Arc Knight. I, Malefic, re I, I do stuff to make rune chance and then I arsenal. Uh, arsenal the card that blows up the aura. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 I'm sorry. Again, this is really long. I'm going to stumble over a lot of stuff. I <clears throat> become the Arc Knight. I play like, yeah, become the Arc Knight, discard an attack, go get the aura killer, play read the runes or Malefic or some, something that makes rune chance, and then arsenal the aura killer. Say go. I have like 10 auras, 10 rune chance. He takes his turn. It doesn't do enough. I go to my turn. <clears throat> I immediately blow up his Zen state and I kill him. 2-1. Feeling pretty decent. Uh, round four, I played against the Viscerai Mirror and I just drew three Mordred Tides and absolutely blew up my opponent. Sorry, bud. But like, <laughs> I just drew hot. Viscerai does that. Um, round five, I play against KO. Uh, I, uh, hit the bad end of variance yet again. My opponent goes first, does some really good setup stuff. Uh, and once again, I have four reds and all I can do is make a rune chant and swing with my sword. So I send four damage. And then they like do some stuff. They roll scabs, hit a six, do some things, play cast bones, hit six attacks, make all the stuff, hit another six attack cast bones on like another turn, blood rush bellows, roll another six on scabs. Like I just get blown up. It's not close. Uh, so unfortunately I am three and two into draft, but that's okay because I'm really confident in my draft. Start drafting uh, and I'm picking earth and rune blade cards. And then fourth pick I get past the Wizard Arms. It's a sacrifice to Amp 1. Now, if you're not super familiar with um, <clears throat> the set, uh, or you're just not familiar with Draft, that is one of the best pieces of equipment in the entire game. It heavily signifies that the people to my left, which would be three people, because it's fourth pick, right? So three people have seen this pack besides me, are not in Wizard. Because if you're in Wizard, you would take that. If you want to be in Wizard, you would take that. Uh, so I shrug and I take it. Maybe I'll play Earth Wizard, right? Next pack is uh, kind of poopy, except it has Lightning Sigil. Sigil Lightning, which is an incredible Asilio card. <clears throat> uh, so I take it because there's really nothing else in the pack. And the next pack, I see another Sigil of Lightning. And I'm like, okay, I'm picking up what you guys are telling me. You're saying none of you are playing Asilio. So I take the Sigil of Lightning. There's a bunch of Wizard cards left in the pack still. Next pack comes, I get Red Trailblazing Aether, a premium, premium red spell for Asilio. Um, <clears throat> so I take it. And then uh, the draft, it keeps going well in pack one. Pack two is a train wreck. It's bad. I don't get much of anything. Turns out the lightning and wizard people are to my left. No big deal. We will clean up in pack three. Pack three comes, and I do not <laughs> clean up. All the wizard cards, gone immediately. Turns out there are five wizard drafters in this pod and two Asilios. I'm the second Asilio. Um, I don't know how that happened. I think people were not drafting wizard and then changed at the end of pack one. Um, but it's fine. My Asilio deck is actually pretty solid. I have the lightning sigils. I have like good equipment. I have good spells and stuff. I have double exploding aether. Like it's totally fine. Um, and then I play against Verdance in the first round. Uh, and they basically go first. They discard Fruits of the Forest. They cast a spell. I blow up my thing to stop some of the arcane. Uh, I go to my turn. I don't do much. My drawn hand does like literally nothing. So I do basically nothing. I do like two damage and pass it back. Um, and they go like, okay, discard Fruits of the Forest. Um... <laughs> uh, yeah, discard Fruits of the Forest, cast Harvest Season, cast Blossoming Decay or whatever. And I'm like, okay, that fucking sucks. Uh, so they've decomposed already. They gain a life and they're attacking for five. I'm like, sure. Um, and then it's my turn and I go, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to attack with Arcane and strain some cards in their hand. They're likely going to have a difficult time actually converting their five card hand. So that's what I do. I do some Arcane and from their arsenal, they play Red Arcane Polarity, gain four life. And then they discard, <laughs> they discard Fruits of the Forest, gaining another two life, putting their third card in the, uh, the Harvest Season Pops and everything, putting their third card in the graveyard. And then they said rend, Red uh, Cadaverous Tilling for eight. 
turning their hero on on turn two. <laughs> so that sucks. Um, and yeah, basically every single I try to strand cards in their hand again and they convert a five card hand again. Which if you play this draft set, that's just like <clears throat> how it goes. You have a really good memory. I'm checking notes on my phone. Yeah. Um so yeah, that's that's just how it went. I just lost the game. They just converted every single hand. It was really bad. Uh round seven, I play against Cecilio. And I don't get to cast any of my exploding aethers. Uh my hands don't work out well. And I lose again. So we're 0-2. And then round three, I play against Avertance. And basically the same thing happens. They convert their hands. I don't. And I lose. And I 0-3 the draft. Now, I've practiced Rosetta drafts a lot. I've probably done over 100. Easily over 100. Uh, online, in person. And I did uh, a few with my testing group, who is very, very talented. <laughs> uh, and I never once 0 3 I 2 one my drafts. This was my first ever out of those hun over a hundred drafts I did where I 0-3'd and it was in Worlds when it mattered. So that felt really bad. I am not qualified for day two. I don't even make it to day two. And I'm feeling a little poopy. <clears throat> I'm feeling poopy about 0-3 in the draft. But secretly, in the back of my head, I'm pretty happy. <laughs> Because I hate barely scraping into day twos. I think it's not very fun. You can't even 4-0 constructed make day two. Uh, you could 5-0 constructed. They, they added an extra round of constructed now. So you could 5-0 constructed 0-3 draft and you do make day two. I'm a little excited though. I hate playing while barely scraping in because you're basically dead for top eight. But this also means that I get to play that sick Michael Hamilton count your blessings new deck. Now... Here's the thing. This is a calling. Calling events are pretty competitive. Calling events at Pro Tours and Worlds are very competitive because you have all the really, really good players that just didn't quite make it, right? Um, Burley Spurlock, Pablo Pintor, Shoma, tons others were all in this calling. But I'm like, fuck it. <laughs> I'm going to play this hero I don't play in this deck I've never played before. And I'm just going to send it. And so that's what I do. I ask people for the cards. I put the deck together the morning of the calling. I register count your blessings new. And we send it. In round one, I sit across from Viscerai. I end up fatiguing him. And I get there. We're 1 0 in the calling. Hell yeah. Round two, I play against the Levia. I banish a bunch of their stuff. They end up basically like killing themselves to blood debt. Because I just banished their blood debt stuff for them, but I'm ripping apart their hands so they just have to take damage. They end up flipping, but it's not enough, and I deck them out. Round three, I'm like, okay, I'm starting to kind of get the feel for this thing, this new deck, but it's really difficult. I hope I don't play against anybody good, <laughs> especially someone who really is comfortable on Assassin. Round three, I play against Shoma, who won the last Pro Tour on Assassin. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, that fucking sucks. <laughs> I hope to God he's not on Azuri again or new. <clears throat> I'm probably not going to beat him if he is. But I sit down and he flips up Ira. And I'm like, okay, I've never played against Ira. I honestly forgot that she's legal because she wasn't legal for Worlds. So we just never thought about her. But she is legal for the calling. Um, and we play a really good game. A couple funny things happen where um, I sirens call and like Ira plays a lot of blues because she wants to go Kadachi two cost or like Kadachi Kadachi one cost two cost you know stuff like that um because it activates her hero power so she plays a lot of blue and I sirens call and he says all reds and he puts all red cards down so I can't take anything from his hand which is like a blow up for me you know that sucks that's really bad but I'm like okay at least they're all reds so he won't be able to convert the hand at all but he puts down like red card red card enlightened strike enlightened strike <laughs> So he just takes the dagger. I can't attack anymore because I didn't draw another card. I just needed resource. Um, he just takes the one damage, goes to hit the turn, and goes Enlightened Strike for five, Enlightened Strike for eight. And I'm like, damn, that's really fucking good. Um, <clears throat> but I ended up managing to get there. I just cast Command and Conquer like five times. Um, anytime I could, 
just prioritize Command and Conquer because the deck plays so many D-Reacts. And I ended up winning the game. So I'm 3-0 on this new deck that I've never played before. How did I feel about CYB new? I think it's very powerful. I think it's very good. Uh, I think it's going to get banned. Like, CYB is going to get banned, but it's very good. Uh, round four, I play the new Mirror, I believe. The rounds might be mixed up a little bit because I, like, went to time or got close to time on a lot of things and had to, like, sprint to the bathroom and didn't jot down notes fast enough. Uh, but I believe round four, I was playing against a new. Uh, maybe around, yeah, round four, playing against a new. Game went very long, and I basically just blocked for the first half of the game. Uh, I talked to Pankaj, or Ethnic Smoke, as you might know him. He's one of the casters now. Great guy. Uh, incredible player. He's my confidant for new stuff. I've basically just been asking him, like, hey, man, how, how do I play new? And I was like, hey, how do I play the new mirror? Really quick, really quick. I got to go, like, come on, before the tournament starts, tell me how to play new, new mirror. And he goes, okay, so when it's your turn, you get you put on all the pressure. When it's not your turn, like, not, like, my turn, your turn, like, in the card game, but, like, Think like a fighting game, you know, like when you're drawing the big disruptive hands, it's your turn. And when you're not drawing the big disruptive hands and your opponent is, it's not your turn like that. So he's like, when it's your turn, you keep the big five card hands and you go nuts and you throw everything at them. When it's not your turn, you block a lot. And I was like, okay, sick. Thanks. So I go and I play and, um, uh, it goes super long and I have no fucking idea what I'm doing, but it feels very similar to a wizard mirror. And I'm pretty good at wizard mirrors. So we play really long. I end up having like a really long string of attacks that I stole from his deck, which is really fun. Uh, you know, Codex of Frailty is really good. And I win the game. I end up taking it down. And I'm like, hell yeah. Uh, but it's really funny because every single time I go, I'm playing new. People are like, oh, wow, new, not Kano. Uh, and then I cast the first Count Your Blessings and they all go. They have to like recontextualize the game in their head of like what it looks like now. Because they're like, oh, okay, counter blessings. So damage isn't as important, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's really funny to see that happen to people. Um, but I win the game. 4-0 in the calling with this new deck I've never played. Uh, I play against Zen next. And um, my inexperience is showing. And I don't board correctly because I don't know how. Uh, I don't board out chi cards. I board out like two. But I'm supposed to board out like four or five, right? Like a lot of them. Um, and it bites me in the ass. We play a game and a lot of things are pretty awkward for me, but I'm kind of making it happen. And then I'm, it's really, really late game. And I need to cast this count your blessings that I know is coming up. I have like two left. Uh, and I draw red, red, red count your blessings. And I'm like, fuck, because all I need to do is either have another three block or a blue, because if I have a three block instead of count your blessings, I just block and it's fine. I don't take any damage. Um, but He's attacking for exactly enough to force me to cast counter blessings instead of blocking and then arsaling. So I have to like, cause it gains like seven life and I only block six. So I have, all right, sorry about that. There's going to be an awkward cut there. Um, the internet went out <laughs> for like a second anyway. So where was I? <clears throat> okay. So I have to pitch double red to cast counter blessings, which is miserable, miserably bad. Um, and my opponent's barely got any cards left in deck. It's mostly just cheat. So it gets to the point where I draw up and it's like card, 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 chi card. And he attacks for two, I block for three. He attacks for one, I block for three. He attacks for three, I block for three. And then he's got one card left in hand and he's just sitting there thinking about it. He's just, he's just sitting there tanking for a while. And I have chi card in hand and I'm at one. And he lays down the last card and it's blue hundred wins. Attacking for one. And he says, that's my last damage in deck. It's my last attack in the deck. So if I block it, I win the game. And I sit there, and I think for a second, and then I show him my chi card that cannot block, and I shake his hand. And he cannot believe it. <laughs> I lost to the literal last point of damage in my opponent's deck because I didn't side out enough chi. And that's just an inexperienced thing. Like, I just didn't know. So I was beating myself up a bit for that one. But it's crazy to lose to the actual last point of damage in your opponent's deck. Um, so I'm four and one, which is still really good. There's eight rounds on day one. Uh, you have to go six and two in order to make it. Round six, uh, I sit down against Aurora, which uh, non-CYB new has a really tough time against. Uh, so I don't know how this is going to go, but I imagine it's going to go better. Uh, and I do. 
basically CYB let me fatigue out this Aurora. Um, it was very close, but yeah, I ended up getting there. I block out like half of their full combo turn and all that kind of stuff. Um, round seven, I win. I don't remember what I played against, so I'm sorry if I played against you. Uh, I just, I just can't remember. I just, I won the game. That's all I got my notes. It just says W. <laughs> round seven, question mark W. That's what it says here. Sorry. So basically, I am locked for day two. And then I sit down and I play against the new mirror. Um, still not really sure how to play the new mirror. I decided to take out my surgical extractions, uh, which I left in in the first new mirror. And my opponent's playing Sigil of Solace and like red um, Art of Desire Body, I think is what it's called. The one that if you banish a red card, you draw a card and you gain a life. Um, and basically like he played double Mist Dagger, which was very good. And I did not have double Mist Dagger. I had Mist Dagger Scale Peeler, which is bad. <laughs> Uh, but he made room for double Mist Dagger, and all my new lists will have that from now on. It was very, very strong. Um, I think I played it really well, but like my Persuasive Prognosis missed, and like my Art of Desires missed, and his Art of Desires hit. Like things just kind of went unfortunately for me. Um, but we got in a game state where uh, we just both had two Chi total, like two Chi in hand, no cards in deck, and I just didn't, I just didn't know what to do. Um, I had lost the game by that point because my opponent still had Mask. And I blocked with mine. And I shouldn't have blocked with mine. But I didn't know that I needed to keep it. Because basically what you can do is you can attack with your... You pitch a chi. You attack with either a dagger or one of your opponent's cards, right? Uh, usually a dagger. And then you mask them. And they have to banish a card from their hand. Leaving them with only one card left. I can respond to the mask by double activating new, right? To get the chi cards out of my hand. But then the issue is if I do that, my opponent, before I draw up on my turn double activates their new, and they banish both by chi cards. So I had lost by that point. Um, and I really think I could have won. I just didn't know how. That was just like lack of experience. Uh, the guy beat me. He ended up going to the, losing in the finals, by the way, this new player. He played very, very well. Really nice guy. Um, I'm going to take, I think, some of his ideas. I'm just going to yoink him <laughs> next time I play new, which I am going to play in Portland, by the way. Um, so I did lose that one, but an incredible game. All day, I just had so much fun uh, with with all the games, which is like, Really, really important to me. Anytime I love a deck, I crush, like I just start crushing tournaments. Uh, if I play how I played like the Viscerai deck, where I'm like, mm, I don't really think this is it. This is good, and I enjoy playing the deck, but like, it's really not what I want to be doing. I don't do very well. I do fine, but like when I play a deck and I'm excited to play every round, I just like I just win tournaments. Um, so I'm so excited to keep playing to keep playing new. Um, the next day, I sit down and my opponent's playing Bravo. And I'm like, oh, it's CYB Bravo because you don't play normal Bravo. Uh, and they just fucking crush me. <laughs> like, it's just like turn one, spinal crush. Turn two, righteous cleansing. Turn three, righteous cleansing. Turn four, uh, crippling crush. Turn five, crippling crush. Like I just, you, no one beats that. Um, and I drew a lot of my power cards, like my Bonds of Agony and stuff in those hands. And I had to block and it was just, it was just bad. I got crushed. It was not particularly close. Got fatigued, unfortunately lost six and three still live for top eight, by the way, uh, round 10, I play against Enigma. Um, I put on some solid pressure and stuff, but, uh, they set up an Enigma and I can't get it off the board very fast. Now I was very worried. Is there a reason why I didn't play Wizard? Yeah, they fucking suck. <laughs> They're so bad. Um, trust me, I would if I could. I would if I could. Um, but, like, the Enigma matchup I was terrified of all day. All, like, all a calling tournament. Because people told me how hard the new matchup is for Enigma already. And then I'm playing the CYB version, which is worse, apparently, right? Um, and then I play into this Enigma and I think I'm playing really well, but they get their, they get their mirror guy up and I can't kill it immediately. And I take a bunch of damage. I go down really low. Um, but I'm able to like keep a decent hand and I pull it out. I get the win, which feels like huge, uh, because I was convinced people just told me that it was basically unwinnable for CYB new. And that is not the case, my guys, let me tell you. Um, but yeah, I won and I was like, I don't have to be scared of anything. Did I play switchboard? Nope. I boarded out the CYBs except the blue ones. I don't even think you have to do that. I think you can play them. Uh, Michael Hamilton played CYBs into enigmas. I just, I like, I didn't have a sideboard guide or anything. I never played the deck. So I'm literally making this stuff up as I go, right? Like every round I'm like, wow, let's try this. Let's, let's see what happens here. You know? 
Um, so I did play against Enigma, and I did win. Uh, round 11, I'm playing against Viscerai, trying to keep the top eight dream alive. Um, and he decides to set up, which is exactly how you're supposed to play in a new, especially CYB new. Um, and basically, nothing I do hits. I hit with Prognosis, flips a blue. It's all reds in hand. Don't get to take any cards. Flip, hit with Prognosis, flips a red. It's all blues and yellows in hand. Don't get to take anything. Every single time I, like, threaten Arsenal, it's a card that doesn't matter. Every single time I, like, do this, it doesn't work. Like, I Siren's Call and all red. I took out Siren's Call. Never mind. Uh, none of my, like, Art of Desires hit. It was just, like, bad. Bad. Um, but I'm, like, still making it happen. And then I get to a spot. The game's, like, close because I'm missing everything. If I wasn't missing everything, it's not close. But it's really close. And I get to a spot where I have CYB in Arsenal. And then my hand is, like, card I'm going to block with. So it's irrelevant. Uh, Codex of Frailty. It's Sorry, it's Warmongers in Arsenal. My hand is Codex of Frailty. Surgical Extraction. Count Your Blessings. Card I'm going to block with. So ignore that. I'm going to cast my Warmongers on my card. I'm going to pick War, obviously. It's going to prevent my opponent from popping off, so they're going to have a five-card hand, and I'm going to need to stop them. So my options are block one Rune Chant by pitching my Surgical Extraction and then cast Count Your Blessings, giving me an extra life. And every, every life is like pretty important at this point. Um, or, and then I'm going to end up Arsaling Codex of Frailty. Or I pitch Codex of Frailty, count your blessings, take one extra damage, and Arsenal Surgical Extraction. And I, I make the wrong decision. I pitch my Surgical Extraction to count your blessings to stop one extra damage, and I Arsenal my Codex of Frailty. However, because I Warmongers, I can't actually cast Codex of Frailty the next turn. Um, and my hand that I draw just doesn't have enough disruption. And I just send Command and Conquer. They crown a Providence away, and they draw into like the Mordred Revel, and they blow me up. Uh, and I lose the game. And I was really close to not losing the game. Uh, and if I had Arsenal Surgical Extraction, I would have been totally fine. Because I could go like uh, Surgical Extraction, give it go again, Command and Conquer you or something, right? Like I, I would have had a lot more options. Um, but I did not do that. And it was my fault. And I lost the game. So knocked out of top eight contention, X and four. Feels pretty bad, but like it was still a really good game. And one of New's worst matchups was Viscerai. Viscerai. So the CYB version felt very good because I was able to, like, threaten. Not a fan of Mong in New in general. Yeah, but it was supposed to, like, this new list is built to beat Viscerai and, like, Dio and stuff. And, like, it does a really good job of it. And Warmongers is part of that. But I get, I get why you wouldn't want to play it otherwise. Um, but it felt nice because, like, I missed a lot of stuff. And my opponent hit pretty hard. Um, and it was still so close and it came down to a misplay. And I think if I'd have played tighter, I'd have had it. So that felt really nice, even though I lost, uh, next round, I play against another enigma and it's a name I recognize, which is always spooky. Um, my game, the game went to time. Uh, he was playing, he was playing pretty slow and, um, I wasn't like hurrying him up or anything though. So like, it's a bit on me. Uh, you know, I, I had a time, a bit of time to think one or two turns, but he, he was playing, he was playing rather slow. Um, and so he ended up going to time and my opponent has six cards left in deck. He's going to finish his turn, draw four cards, and then there's going to be two cards left in deck. I'm going to have a five card turn. He has one threat left in deck, which is mirror guy. Now we don't know the order of the cards because he had cast stir the pot a little bit earlier or I had hit with bonds or something. Basically it got shuffled. So we don't know the order. The judge stops us and says, that's time. You have to make a decision if someone's going to concede the game right now. And I say, I'm not willing to concede because I believe myself to be in a favorable position. And he sits there and he looks through everything. He looks through my cards. He looks through his graveyard. He looks through my graveyard, all this stuff, right? But we're not allowed to talk about the game state. We can't like... We can't go like, okay, I have this cards, blah, blah, blah. You're going to do this. You only have these cards left in deck. Blah, blah. We, we're not allowed to do that. But you're allowed to look through the game state, right? Um, Zarian, thank you for the prime. Appreciate that, man. And so he looks through the game state. He's clearly thinking about the mirror guy he has left. Um, but my hand's like insane. It's like surgical extraction plus chi card plus like other stuff. Like I'm going to do a lot of stuff. 
Um, and he uh, eventually decides to concede, which was very kind of him. I do think I win the game in like 80 plus percent of that situation. Like if the six cards are shuffled and randomized and we play it out, I think I win about 80% of the time. It's not guaranteed, but a lot. But because of how the cards actually were situated, I do win 100% of the time. Because Mirror Guy would have been the top card. I would have made my surgical attack. I would have transcended. I would have activated new. And I would have got the Mirror Guy off the top. And then he wouldn't have had threats left. And I would have won the game. Um, very kind of him to concede, though. Uh, so I end, I end up winning that one. And that is um, the last game in the calling. Uh, so I finished up, uh, what is that, like uh, nine and four, which I was very proud of considering I hadn't played the deck. I did cash for about $200 which doesn't put a dent in my Japan <laughs> travel fees, but it helps, right? You know, any, any little bit helps. I just had a blast playing the deck. So I went and like, I went around all the vendors and I bought a bunch of the cards, but like they're cheaper in Japanese because I'm in Japan. So I bought a bunch of the assassin cards all in Japanese. Uh, and I'm like, when I go to my local game store on Wednesday, I'm going to buy all the commons and everything and finish building the deck. I'm really stoked. Um, but we had uh, two teammates, uh, top eight, the calling Casanova and, um, Casanova and Nia both top aided, which is incredible. They did really, really good. Uh, our team ended up having a, quite a good showing actually over the course of the weekend. Um, and so Sunday comes and we find out, well, it's Saturday night, we find out that Mercy, who used to be a local of mine, top aided world <laughs> on the Aurora list that she switched to. That was our team's Aurora list. And we're like, fuck yeah. Hell yeah. So obviously we're all going to root for Mercy. Um, Sunday comes, Peter's like, hey man, I want to play uh, LL, what should I play? And I'm like, you should play Kano, literally just here's my Kano deck, go play that. Uh, and he's like, sick, thanks. Um, so he starts playing Kano in LL. We're watching Worlds, and Mercy's winning. Uh, sorry, this is this is Sunday, I got, I got mixed up. Day two of the calling is Sunday, so we're watching Top 8 Worlds, I'm playing in the calling, and the Living Legend Tournament, this is all going on at the same time. Uh, Mercy's winning her games. She wins her quarterfinals. She's going up against Sam Sutherland in the semifinals. And we basically decide this matchup is absolutely unwinnable. You just have to high roll him. And so she goes and she sits down and she plays her game. And she just fucking high rolls the shit out of him. <laughs> like she plays really cleanly and everything. But she just high rolls the shit out of this guy and wins the semifinals. And we're like, holy shit, Mercy's in the finals of Worlds. Uh, she's up against CYB Enigma, pure fatigue Enigma. We're talking like three Oasis respite, all D reacts, count your blessings Enigma, full fatigue. Um, and it's like an hour and a half, two hour long game. And she just doesn't quite get there. I, I don't want to talk about how the game went. Cause it was like not fun to watch. <laughs> uh, I bet James White was pissed <laughs> when that world's finals happened. Cause it was not entertaining. It's not the player's fault, right? The players are going to play whatever's best. Uh, and CYB Enigma was like probably the best deck in the field that day and deserved to win. And it did. Um, but it was like not entertaining to watch. The game was over after 40 minutes and you just had to sit there and watch someone like slowly just try to punch sand <laughs> and get through for like another hour and a half. It was not very fun. Uh, but mercy played really, really well. Incorrect. Like I, I can't believe she took second at Worlds. That's just so sick. It's so surreal seeing someone that you play with at your locals like finish that highly. You know, think they ban it or something for play pattern reasons? Yes, one hundred percent. I think Monday it will be banned, which is tomorrow. Um, so Mercy took second at Worlds. Enigma won. Uh, and Peter's playing the LL tournament. So we go watch Peter play the LL tournament, and he's just fucking cooking people. Just cooking people. LL Kano's ridiculous, right? You got 15 of your cards are basically tomes. So he just activates Kano. Like, he just, like, looks at his hand. His opponent kind of taps out. He shrugs, activates Kano, and his opponent explodes. That's basically what happened every single round. Except the last round. The last round of Swiss, Peter is playing against CYB Old Him. So he pitch stacks, right, as you maybe should do. Uh, now I don't think you actually should pitch stack any deck. I think maybe you should like kind of slightly pitch stack it. Uh, but I think you should just cosplay as a merchant hero, play out a bunch of potions. And then the second they step out of line, you fucking blow them up. That's what I think you should do, but he's pitch stacking it. Um, and he messes up, <laughs> he messes up, thinks there's a tome on top. It's not a tome and he loses the game. They go to top eight, which he makes it in. And, uh, the old him also makes it in. And he says, hey, Majin, uh, can I borrow your jersey? Because his got wet. Because it was like 
pouring the last two nights. And I'm like, yeah, 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 sure. Because they want to do a team a top eight picture, and he wants to be wearing the Metal Fab Tokens jersey. So I let, I let him borrow my jersey. Um, so he's got a Majin Bay jersey on. So they do the pictures, and he's playing. And everyone makes the joke. And this is kind of like the inside joke that was going on throughout the tournament, is that since I wasn't playing Kano or a wizard, I was no longer Majin Bay. I was just Caleb. And people who were playing wizard were Majin Bay. So now that Peter's playing the tournament as a wizard, that's why he has the Majin Bay jersey on, because he's now Majin Bay. Majin Bay is not a person. It's an idea. <laughs> it's like a concept. Um, and it was a really funny like meme, especially because he continued to do well in the tournament. Um, they're playing. He like cooks his quarterfinals and semifinals opponent. Um, and he has to play the finals against Count Your Blessings old him. But the issue is they're going to have to go play it outside because it's Count Your Blessings old him. The tournament went really long. And the old him says like, this is what Peter told me. I don't actually know if this is true. This is, this is totally hearsay. But Peter said, because we see him, we leave for dinner because we're not staying in. They kick us out of the venue, right? So we leave for dinner. Um, and we're like, okay, Peter will meet us at dinner in like an hour and a half. Because they have to finish the semifinals, and then he's got to play the finals against a guardian, either Starver or Oldham. But we get into the restaurant, and he immediately shows up. And we're like, what? Like, what? Why are you here? Like, didn't you have to play the finals? And he's like, oh, yeah, I won. <laughs> we're like, what do you mean you won? It's been like five minutes. And he's like, yeah, yeah. So the old him won the semifinals. And then he said, hey, are you going to stack me? And Peter's like, yeah. So I just said yes. He's like, yeah, I'm going to stack you. And the old him goes, Okay, yeah. Well, I know you're a good enough player to not fuck it up, so I'll just concede to you. You can have the win. And let Peter win the battle hard. And I'm like, that's fucking insane because you actually did fuck it up against him in the end of Swiss. You literally messed it up and lost the game because of it. I cannot believe he let you get away with murder like this. Uh, but yeah, Peter won the battle hard on L.O. Kano. Uh, and yeah, it was the list I'd been working on for a little bit. I'd played zero games, but I was like, I'm pretty sure this list is the truth. And then he goes and wins the Battle Harden on it. It was super sick. When he takes the Battle Harden picture, if you see the Battle Harden winning picture, he is wearing my jersey turned around so that you can see the Majin Bay <laughs> on it. I'll see if I can find the picture. It's very, very funny. But we have some more dinner. It's pretty good. All food in Japan is fantastic. Um, just like, honestly, you just walk around. And you just like find whatever and it's good. That's, that's the move in Japan. Okay. Where's this picture? I'm going to find it. I'm going to find it. I'm going to find it. There it is. Okay. Let me switch to the different view. Boop, 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 boop. Someone was asking about uh, the bazaar. Boom. There it is on my screen. Sorry. There I am. There it is on the screen. <laughs> Thought that was funny. All right. Here's the boom. <laughs> Peter with the Kano, his gold foil, Majin Bay jersey. Thought that was really funny. Goes with the whole meme, right? That like Majin Bay is an idea. I did it again. There we go. <laughs> that Majin Bay is like the concept, not the player. Um, so he takes it down. Super stoked for him. He opened um, Carrion Husk as his gold foil, which is really cool. Um, after that, we go back to the Airbnb. We have a bunch of drinks. Everyone's drinking. Um, they end up playing. <laughs> Everyone gets. A lot of people get drunk. And what they're doing, we have like these incredibly, incredibly talented Flesh and Blood players. And what they're doing is they got drunk and they played Ira, Ira Starter Deck Mirrors all night. That's all they did. Ira Starter Deck Mirrors, which looks miserable, by the way. But they're like keeping track. They're like, yeah, I've won 12. You've only won 11. Blah, 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 blah. It's so fucking dumb. Uh, but we had a good time. We're all hanging out. It's, you know, Brian and Mercy came through. We got to congratulate her. Um, she did something really cool. Uh, Ellie put in a lot of work to help her out apparently this is what i heard i wasn't there <clears throat> to get her up to speed on the deck um and so mercy had ellie open the gold foil which is pretty cool um and had decided to give the gold foil to ellie as a thanks for helping her now ellie is like probably the most well-known bolton player on the planet i feel like uh and she opened um the the gold foil was warband of bologna a Bolton legendary, which was like just so cool. Um, so, so funny how that worked out. So that was a really cool thing that happened. And then, yeah, that was it for my time in Osaka. We went to the aquarium, which was phenomenal. If you end up in Osaka, you should definitely do that. Um, and then we end up, uh, we go to Tokyo. We hop on the bullet train, head to Tokyo. And uh, 
I'm going to try to speed through the rest of the story time. I know it's been really long. You can pick up on the name who's the best Bolton player. I don't know who the best Bolton player is because she's not playing Bolton, but Ellie Bird. Uh, she definitely plays a lot of Bolton. Um, I can't say who the best Bolton player is because no one plays him right now. Uh, and I actually just don't know. But yeah, we're on the way to Tokyo. Uh, we end up going to Disney Sea, which is a really cool resort. And um, I read, well, she read an article, Larissa, uh, read an article about Disney Sea and all the rides you should do and what restaurants you should go to. You say wizards suck and you see Alex Voron and Silio doing a great run. Okay, I talked about this earlier in the stream. You must not have been here for it. But uh, no, Asilio is bad. <laughs> Alex Moore went four and five on Asilio. He just 6 0 draft. <laughs> and I told him this. I told him this was going to happen. I was like, God damn it, Mr. Moore. Now everyone's going to come on my stream and they're going to say, see, wizards don't suck. And I'm going to have to explain to them that actually they do. You're just really good at draft. Anyway, so we're, we're reading this article about Disney Sea. What rides to go on, what restaurants to go to. And the article says you have to reserve this place called Magellan's. It's like a fine dining restaurant in Disney Sea. You got to go. And we're like, okay. So we're fighting to get a reservation for Magellan's. Don't really get it. Uh, but we keep checking throughout the day. And eventually we do get in. And we're stoked. So we go. And this is one of those places. That's, again, it's fine dining. Um, you can only order a course. It's two pre-made courses. You can't like switch things out um and the issue is a lot of the items on the courses are cream and dairy and cheese which i can't have i'm super lactose super lactose intolerant and i'm like oh no i like won't get to eat any of this um but they have a dietary restriction menu with one course on it and i'm like oh i'll just get this that's fine um so we come they come we order and they don't speak very good English, right? It's, it's still in Japan. Um, and Larissa orders, no problem. And I say, hey, I, I want this. And she's like, you want to order this? I'm like, yeah, I want, I want this. And she's like, one second. So she goes and brings like her manager that speaks better English. And her manager says like, hey, do you have an allergen? And I'm like, yeah, I can't have dairy. And she's like, okay, so you want this? And I'm like, yeah, can I have this and a Coke? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. No problem. It's going to take a long time though. But this is like not in good English, right? So it sounds kind of like there's there's a lot of miscommunications here. It sounds like this. This long time, okay? And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. And they go, okay, it's small. And I'm like, yeah, no, that's fine. Like, okay. And Coke? And I'm like, yeah, and Coke. And they go, okay. So they leave. And a little bit later, this guy comes by, another like waiter there. Um and he hands Larissa a plate with a little butter knife and some butter on it. Not me. It's clearly only on Larissa's side of the table. And I'm like, that's kind of weird. But I guess I did tell them I can't have dairy. So, of course, they're not going to give me butter, right? That just makes sense. Um, and then he sets up her silverware, makes everything look all nice. And then he goes over to my silverware. And we have, like, a big fork and a small fork and a small knife and a big boy knife. And he, like, looks at my silverware. And he looks at me. He looks at my silverware. He looks back at me. And he clearly like hesitates for a little bit. And then he just kind of like slowly stutteringly reaches in. And he takes away my big fork and my big boy knife. <laughs> and I'm like, that's kind of weird. But I guess like the main course is fish. So I don't really need like a large knife. Maybe it's because like you have like a, you know, a beef and I have like fish. So they just took away the knife, whatever. And then the waitress comes back the one who doesn't speak very good English. And she's like, basically says, Hey, no Coke, no Coke. And I'm like, Oh, they're out of Coke. Okay. And she goes, do you want orange juice or apple juice? And I'm like, well, surely there's other options. And she's like, no, no. With this orange juice, apple juice. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'll have apple juice since they're out of Coke. It's weird that they're out of Coke. And she goes like, apple juice. Okay. Apple juice. She writes it down and she goes, and do you want Coke? And I'm like, well, I thought you were out of Coke. And she's like, you want Coke? Apple juice, Coke? And I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, I guess, I guess I'll have an apple juice. And she leaves, and I start thinking to myself, oh, wait a second. It's a fucking kid's meal. <laughs> That's why they took away my big boy knife, because you don't give a big boy knife to people who order on the kid's menu. Because they're not allowed to have it. That's why the guy was acting so weird about it. Because he's like, who is this giant ass adult? Remember, I'm big in Japan. Like, I'm large. 
And so they're like, who's this bearded fucking man? <laughs> who's ordering on the kids menu? Oh my God. So they bring the food. They bring Laura to her food. They bring me this like sickly sweet pumpkin soup. It's terrible. It's clearly not made for adult palates, right? And it's gross and I don't eat it. And then they bring us the food and my all my food is in Mickey Mouse shapes. <laughs> So I have like my rice and it's three scoops of rice, one big scoop and two little scoops, which are like the little Mickey Mouse face. I have a pile of vegetables and on top of the vegetables is one small little Mickey Mouse shaped carrot, right? Like all that stuff. It's so fucking funny. And Larissa's dying, just dying, right? So I eat, <laughs> I eat my little kid's meal and then we, we walk out. It wasn't even very good. And then we leave. Don't go to Magellan's. It's not great. Um, but I just thought that was too funny not to share it, that I went to a fine dining restaurant and accidentally ordered the kids menu. There wasn't any other option, but like, cause I, you know, couldn't have the, couldn't have the, the dairy and stuff, but it was just really funny. Um, another thing that happened is, um, we went to this place called Mr. Soy. It's a donut shop. Now I don't like donuts very much, but I love custard filled donuts, but I can't have them. However, this place is called Mr. Soy, and it makes a big deal about everything being soy. Uh, this was back in Kyoto, so in the first couple days of the trip. I order, and later that night, I eat the donut, and a quarter of the way through the donut, I can tell this is going to mess up my stomach. There's clearly some lactose in this thing, and it fucking kills me for like the next 24 hours. I'm just dying, right? And I'm like, okay, it says it's... Mr. Soy, yeah, I'm very lacto very lactose intolerant. It says it's Mr. Soy. Why did this mess me up so much? Everything's soy. That was like their whole shtick. So later in Tokyo, we go to a place that's like soy boba or something, right? It's like a soy coffee place that's boba. We go in and um, we are ordering. Larissa orders, no problem there. And I say, hey, can I get like the brown sugar boba uh, with soy milk? Because it's called like soy something boba. And she goes, we don't have soy milk. I'm like, what, what the fuck do you mean you don't have soy milk? You've got soy in your name. And sure enough, she points at the menu and she's like, it's only whole milk. You only can get whole milk. And I don't know, I don't know why this is a thing. But like, if you're lactose intolerant and you go to Japan, keep that in mind. If they put soy in the name of things, it's still fucking whole milk. I don't know why. I have literally no clue, but like that sucked. So I ended up just getting like a fruit tea or something, you know, something basic. Um, so every other place that said soy, there was a lot of them. We just didn't go to. I was like, all right, well, I can't, can't do this. Um, yeah. And that's basically like it. There's a lot of other stuff that happened. So much stuff that happened in that trip. But um, that was the main, the main gist of it. Uh, another fun part, probably one of my favorite parts of the trip Um Two more, two more small things. Two more small things. One of them, uh, we went into an isekaya where the – very, very small. Isekaya culture is really cool, by the way. It's one of my favorite parts about Japan. Um, it's like – it's just really, really, really small restaurants, basically. Like ma and pa shops with like six whole seats. Sometimes you can't even sit down. And a lot of them, you can't sit down. You, you have to eat standing up because there's not enough room in the building. You know, they can't fit seven people <laughs> sitting down. Um, so we go into one of them. We're just walking down alleys, find one, walk in. Um – and we're trying to order off this menu, but the menu is entirely in Japanese. And usually we just like use Google Translate or whatever, but we don't because they're trying to talk to us. The owner does not speak English. Not a lick of English. Um, weird, aren't like 90% of Japanese people lactose intolerant? Okay, so there's this weird thing in like Asian culture where they just ignore like food allergies and like intolerances. Like they have it a lot less, but like they just pretend they don't <laughs> have it at all. I can't, I can't really explain it. I was talking to Larissa about it, who is Chinese, by the way. Um, but like, you just pretend you don't have it. Like, they just don't acknowledge it. If they don't have, like, if they can't really have milk, it, they're lactose intolerant. They just still have milk. That's just, that's just what they do. Um, Anyway, so we're at this restaurant and we're trying to order. The owner does not speak a lick of English, but the other patrons, everyone in Japan wants you to have a good time. They're like the nicest people. Um, and so the other patrons are trying to help us order and they're trying to talk to us and they speak a little English. And so we're trying to tell them like, hey, we'll have whatever you're having. You tell us what's good and we'll order it. Like, and so they're like, okay, okay, okay. 
So they're trying to convince us to order what they like, right? And so one guy comes up and he's got his plate and he's got like one piece of food left. And it's like a toast with like a sashimi on it. And he's like, hey, hey, toast garlic, toast garlic, fish on top is very good. <laughs> and we're like, sick, we'll take two. <laughs> Basically, they're trying to like describe to us the food and doing a pretty good job considering their English skills. And we're just like, yep, yep, we'll take that. We'll order that. Uh-huh. Yep. Because, you know, it's like a plate at these isekayas is like $4. It's like nothing. You know, we got like these giant shots of sake for like 100 yen each. Like it's cost nothing. Um, so we're just eating all this food. And it's so good. It's all so good. I If you haven't been to Japan, I can't explain it to you. But like everything in Japan tastes good. All the food is just such better quality. You can feel it when you eat it. Like, everything's just more fresh. It's not as, like, preservative filled. Like, everything's just better. Um, so we just eat anything they put in front of us. And it's all very good. But it was just so funny that these, like, these locals who just wanted us to have a good time were, like, doing charades <laughs> with us to try to, like, get us to order their favorite thing. It's just very funny. Um, later, uh, we end up meeting with a bunch of people you know, from all over New Zealand, Singapore, everywhere. Uh, and we go out to, um, to this place. that's pretty famous for having like a bunch of bars, very, 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 very small bars, right? Like the size of this room is like a pretty decently sized one. So you have the bar, a bench for some people to sit. like, this would be a bigger sized one on this street. And every building's like two stories. Uh, a lot of them is like one bar. And then the next story is another bar. Very, very, very small, but they cater to a lot of foreigners. It seems like, uh, so we mob in there, Party of 10, can't fit anywhere. We find one place that has a downstairs and an upstairs. Like six bar seats downstairs, maybe four. Like really not a lot of room. And then the upstairs is kind of like a loft room area, which we can go up into. Uh, so we order our drinks. We head up in, up in there and we're just hanging out, having a good time. Now we run out of drinks, but we don't want to keep going downstairs and buying more because it's crowded and stuff and they cost a lot. So a couple of the people go and they buy a bunch of soju and mixed drinks from like the nearby 7-Eleven, which by the way, everyone's going to tell you the convenies, like convenience stores in Japan are great and they are and they're under exaggerating how good they are. <laughs> Everything there is good and cheap, you know, like $3 sojus, all that kind of stuff. So they come back and we can't, we obviously can't take all this alcohol that we bought elsewhere and walk it past the bartender, like the person who owns the restaurant. They're not going to let us do that. So what we do is we open the window to the outside and they throw them in <laughs> from the street and then walk back in and we all just enjoy our drinks and everything. Have a really good time. Um, <clears throat> we end up after that going to karaoke, uh, which we fucking killed, by the way. It was so sick. Um someone put on lose yourself by Eminem and I did that whole thing and it was great. I've been waiting for that moment my entire life. Right. Uh, and then afterwards they're like, Hey, we should go to a club. And it's like two 30 in the morning, two 33 o'clock in the morning. We're like, I want to go to a fucking club, bro. I want to go to sleep. And they're like, no, 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 we should go to a club. Uh, and we're like, no. And they go, yeah, it's like a four minute walk. Come on. And we're like, uh, okay, fine. We'll go to the club. Yeah, a lot of the over, a lot of the late night stuff in Japan, uh, Cross Under's got it right. Uh, stays open really late because if you miss the last train, which is at midnight, you just go to karaoke or the club and you stay until five a.m. when the trains come back online and then you leave. That's like a common thing. So we go to the club. We walk down there. We walk in. It's downstairs. There's no cover and it's just like a dark bar with music. It's it's not a club. And we're like. What? <laughs> but like the group's drunk, right? Like everyone's drunk, but we're pretty confused because this is not a club. Um, and one of the people in the group's like, yeah, so um, we actually don't have clubs in New Zealand. <laughs> so I don't think they know what they are. <laughs> it was super funny because we're just like... We're just staying there and like the Americans in the group are like, this is not a club. And everyone who's not from America, is just like by themselves, like just drunk as shit, like just dancing by themselves in this bar with music is so funny. So fucking funny. 
Um, and that's where we end the night. We end up we end up heading back to our hotel after that. We just get an Uber or whatever. Oh, well, have a good night's sleep. And that was that's basically the trip. Uh, I did so many other things that I'm like not going to talk about just because it would make the story time even longer than it already is. But such a blast. Japan was by far my favorite trip that I've ever been on. It's just an incredible place. It's so much fun. Um, and having the Flesh and Blood Worlds tournament there was great. The new set looks wild. They're releasing Aurelia and Jarvan. <laughs> and like seven Arachnes. What's that about? Um, it looks really interesting. How did I manage to come back? I got on my budget airline flight. Um, Larissa left in the morning and I was stuck because... Um, because uh, I had to book that budget airline back, right? The emergency flight back, which didn't leave till like 9.30 p.m. Uh, but I had these giant luggage and I had to get two hours away to the Narita airport. Um, and so I was really worried about taking public transit. So I gave myself a lot of time and my hotel kicked me out at like 11, right? The checkout time. So I left the hotel at 11. My plane doesn't leave till 9.30. And instead of like the four hours that I thought it would take, it ended up taking one hour for me to get there. I found a really efficient way to get there um, after I'd already left. And so I just sat in this airport forever. I went up to the counter and I was like, hey, can I check these bags for this flight that's at 930? It's noon, by the way. And they're like, yeah, of course you can check them in six and a half hours. Like, why are you trying to check? It's noon, bro. <laughs> like, You, you got to wait a while. So I just mobbed around this airport with my giant ass luggage i tried out all the restaurants at the airport they were fantastic because all the food in japan is incredible um and by the time i finally get to get on my plane i'm exhausted i've been at this airport for nine and a half hours i've been traveling for like over 10 sit on my seat and just try to make it through it's 11 hours. Finally get back. My brother picks me up. Two hour drive. Get home and just crash. And then it's today. Yay. And here we are. I woke up, started streaming, played the bazaar, had a good time. Um, I think my sleep schedule will go back to normal here pretty soon, which is good. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that was a trip. I'm really excited to get back and make some content. Uh, things I'm looking forward to for content, which you might want to keep an eye out, are new Patreon posts. It's been a while. I've been gone. Uh, I'm going to make write-ups about the decks that I played, both CYB New and Viscerai. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the LL Kano deck, uh, on YouTube. I would really like to make a series where I give a beginner's guide to characters. Hey, here's new. Here's her important cards. Here's her play style. Here's what she's good against. Here's what she wants to be doing. Here's some interesting little combos you can do that kind of stuff. I think that'd be really fun. Um, so I want to do that for a lot of the flesh and blood heroes. I think that'd be really cool. I think that's kind of missing in the community. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. And yeah, that's the, that's the story time. Uh, thank you everybody. So much for coming. I got Portland here in two weeks. Going to be playing new. Look forward to that. And uh, yeah. Thanks for coming. See you guys next time.